being a teenager can be a struggle. Being a parent to a teenager can also be a struggle, especially if your teenager is dating someone that you don't approve of. But the subjects of today's true crime story took their teenage angst too far. When being threatened with no longer being allowed to see each other, they became the youngest double murderers in the UK. So this is the story of the Twilight Killers, Kim Edwards and Lucas Markham. If you're new here, my name is Elise, and today you're going to see Elise clean and talk about true crime. So welcome back to a new episode of Cleaning and Crime. I love to listen to true crime while I clean my house, so every week I post a new motivating whole house cleaning video of me cleaning my house, while at the same time, I'm telling you about a true crime case that's interesting to me. So, cleaning and crime. So I've taken my interest of true crime and my love of cleaning, and I've merged the two. If the cleaning footage is too distracting for you, or if you're just not into it, I also offer the crime-only bonus video version of every story on YouTube. So if you're looking for that one, I'll put the link for it in the YouTube description box or put a thingy over my head. You can also find the Cleaning and Crime podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts if you just want to listen to today's true crime story. Let's get into today's story. Today I'm going to tell you about Kim Edwards and Lucas Markham and how they became the UK's youngest double murderers. At the age of 14. Yikes. Besides holding that unfortunate title, they also have a bit of a nickname. Like, you know how the media always give killers nicknames? They're known as the Twilight Killers. And we'll get to why that is later in the story. And it's pretty weird. Also, this is your quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed on YouTube or hit that plus sign to follow me on TikTok because I post a new episode every week. On April 14th, 2016, in Spalding, Lincolnshire in England, hopefully I said that right, Elizabeth Edwards and her daughters, 14-year-old Kim and 13-year-old Katie, were all missing. Kim and Katie hadn't shown up for school and Elizabeth didn't show up for work at the elementary school she worked at. She didn't call in, she didn't show up, which was very unusual for her. She never missed work, she was very dedicated. And it was obviously very unusual and troubling that all three of them were missing. So the girls' schools and Elizabeth's school, they're all calling the house trying to get a hold of somebody, but nobody can get a hold of anybody. Not only were the schools worried, but Elizabeth's partner, Graham Green, was also very concerned because he couldn't get a hold of Elizabeth either. I believe Graham was a truck driver, so he was gone for work a lot, but he said he was always in contact with Elizabeth by phone, and it was very unusual for her to not answer the phone. Also missing from school was Kim's 14-year-old boyfriend, Lucas Markham. He was reported missing by his aunt, who he lives with. So, a lot of people missing. Relatives and neighbors were going over to the Edwards' home, and they were knocking, but nobody was answering. And people showed up several times, like 5 p.m., 7 p.m., 9 p.m. No answer. Whenever anybody knocked, they could hear the dog barking, but then there was no other movement in the house. The next day, still nobody shows up for work or school. So finally, 36 hours later, the police finally do a wellness check. They knock on the door. They hear the dog, but nothing. So they decide to force their way into the home through a downstairs window, and they walk into the house. When they get into the house, they go straight to the living room, and they find Kim Edwards and Lucas Markham, both 14, snuggled up under blankets on a mattress in the middle of the living room. They had a few liquor bottles around them, they had a few empty ice cream cartons, and they were just cuddling, watching TV. So the cops were like, uh, hey, (laughs) what's going on? Didn't you hear people knocking? And they were just like, oh, hey. The cops are like, what's going on? Where, where's your mother and sister? We've been looking for you guys. And Kim just says, upstairs. The cops are like, why are they upstairs? What's going on? And Lucas looks the cop dead in the eyes and calmly says, why don't you go up there and see? Upstairs, they found Elizabeth and 13-year-old Katie both dead in their beds. And there was blood everywhere. Walls, ceiling, all over the beds. Both of them had been slashed in the throat and they had been there in their beds for the past two days. The weapon, an eight inch kitchen knife, was still in Kim and Katie's bedroom, just tossed to the side. And Kim and Lucas were just hanging out downstairs with Elizabeth and Katie's bodies just upstairs the whole time. So Kim and Lucas were arrested on the spot and Lucas yelled out, fuck life. And just as the two were being led outside, Elizabeth's partner, Graham, pulled up. Poor guy. He said he was walking up to the house and he made eye contact with Kim and she just 
looked down to the ground in shame and he just knew. His heart dropped. He knew something horrible had happened. He was devastated. Shortly after Graham got there, Kim and Katie's half-sister, Mary, who was married with kids and lived in a different town, showed up and the two of them went and identified the bodies, which Graham said he wouldn't wish on his worst enemy. So it turns out, yes, Kim and Lucas had killed Elizabeth and Katie and they stayed in the home the entire time afterwards, the whole 36 hours. They had planned the murders in advance. They had no regrets, showed no remorse, showed no emotion. They did it for their love. So how the hell did we get here? Let's go back. Elizabeth Edwards, the mother, was described as a wonderful person. She loved working with kids. She worked at the primary school. She volunteered after school with after school programs. She was very active in the church. She was bubbly and happy and just everyone loved her. Elizabeth and her partner Graham had been together for a long time and they were actually planning their wedding when the murders took place. And Graham had just gotten the family a dog. So Graham was not Kim and Katie's father. The girl's father had apparently been abusive to Elizabeth and he struggled with substance abuse. And Elizabeth had said that the girls had witnessed some of the domestic abuse in the home. But then the father left when the girls were very young. And then Elizabeth was a single mother raising the girls on her own. Graham, the partner, said that when he first came into the picture, Kim was a tough nut to crack. But he really loved the girls and he was planning on spending the rest of his life with Elizabeth. And he later said that Kim and Lucas ruined his life. Katie, the younger sister, she was basically the polar opposite of her sister, Kim. She was very popular, outgoing, happy, friendly. Everybody loved her. Whereas Kim felt very lonely. She felt like the black sheep of the family. And she felt like an outsider. She struggled with depression and she had a very different relationship with her mother than her sister Katie did. Katie and Elizabeth got along super well. They had a great relationship. They were very close. Whereas Kim had more of a combative relationship with her mother and they argued constantly. Kim even stated after the murders, quote, Ever since I was young, I never got on with my mom. I knew that she favored my sister more than me. Even though she said that she didn't, I knew she was lying, end quote. But that's Kim's words. That's how Kim viewed things. So Kim Edwards. Kim was born on June 13th, 2001. And it seems Kim had a very strained relationship with her mother from a very early age. And the first instance where people realized things were tough in the home was when Elizabeth, the mother, called social services and reported herself because she had struck six-year-old Kim in the face after an argument over television. So Elizabeth hit Kim in the face when she was six. And then it seems like she snapped out of it. Like, oh my God, what have I done? And she called social services on herself. So there was an investigation and both Kim and Katie were removed from the home for about six months. The girls were returned back to Elizabeth, but Elizabeth told close friends and family that she believes Kim never forgave her for that. After that, Kim remained a difficult child. Kim and Elizabeth argued all the time, and Kim harbored some jealousy toward her sister Katie for the relationship she had with their mother. Kim felt that Elizabeth just did not love her and that she favored her sister Katie. But Elizabeth's partner Graham didn't agree with that. He said he never saw any kind of favoritism. It was just Katie got along better with her mom and Kim didn't. In 2013, Kim accused Elizabeth of trying to strangle her, but both Katie and Elizabeth denied that this ever happened. So a tense home life with lots of arguing, and then things only got worse when Kim started dating Lucas Markham. Lucas was born Stan Lucas Markham on August 1st, 2001. Lucas also grew up with an abusive home life. His parents had a violent relationship and his father struggled with alcoholism. Then when Lucas was about four, their marriage crumbled and all the kids, him and his brothers, ended up being taken out of the home and put into foster care. But then their aunt ended up adopting the boys. Shortly after that, when Lucas was about five, his mother died from leukemia and then his father just didn't want anything to do with the kids and just disappeared. So they just remained with their aunt. In school, Lucas had anger issues. He frequently got into fights. He had explosive outbursts. He had a lot of trouble with authority figures. He would also have violent outbursts at home. He would headbutt and punch doors and walls. One of Lucas's school friends said that Lucas was put into a behavioral unit at the school because of getting into so many fights and that he was just always angry with people. But he said besides his anger issues, he was actually really nice and you could sit down and have a really good conversation with him. And that brings us to Kim and Lucas meeting. Both of them were in the behavioral unit at the school for difficult teens. And one day in eighth grade English that Kim and Lucas were both in, Lucas got super pissed off in class and exploded into a fit of rage and picked up his chair and threw it across the room. When Kim saw that, she was like, oh yeah, 
That's my guy. That's my man right there. That's the one. They were 13 at the time. And after class, Kim was like, yo, I'm into you. The way you threw that chair was super hot. And Lucas was like, awesome. We're dating now. So they started dating right away and they were inseparable. And their relationship got really intense really quickly. Psychiatrists that evaluated them later basically explained that they both had sort of similar pasts with abusive fathers in the household. They both had similar feelings of abandonment. They both felt like they didn't fit in with their families. They were both struggling with their emotions and their anger. And they bonded quickly over their similar struggles or similar stories. And they just quickly had a very profound connection. Lucas felt like the only one that loved him was Kim. And he finally felt accepted and it was just intoxicating. They developed like an us against the world mentality and they were very codependent. Lucas had been bullied by his classmates and when him and Kim started dating, that bullying then kind of extended to Kim too because she was dating him. And that kind of pushed them even further into their own little bubble, made them feel even worse. Like nobody gets us, only you get me. It's us against them, you know? And even the couple's close friends were like, creeped out at how incredibly close they were. Like, they're 13. (laughs) Right away, Lucas and Kim were spending every minute possible together. And Lucas became a regular piece of furniture at the Edwards house. Graham immediately got bad vibes from Lucas and didn't like him. He thought he was quiet and arrogant and had a serious attitude problem. Kim's mother, Elizabeth, also did not approve of the relationship. Kim already had an attitude problem, in her opinion, and so she thought Lucas was a super bad influence on Kim. And she could see how close they were, and they had kind of an obsessive relationship. And on top of that, Elizabeth found out that Kim and Lucas were sexually active. Nobody wants to find out that their 13-year-old daughter is sexually active with a boy that you totally don't approve of. So Elizabeth was very concerned. In the fall of 2015, Lucas was getting into all kinds of trouble, still getting into a ton of fights at school. And because Lucas was getting into so much trouble and they didn't approve of the relationship, Elizabeth and Graham decided to ban Lucas from coming over to the house. So this was devastating to Kim and Lucas, and it reinforced that everyone's against us mentality. So what did they do? They ran away together in October 2015, and they lived in a tent in the woods for six days. Nobody knew where they were. Everybody was freaking out. And on the sixth day, they went into town to pick up supplies and food, and they were recognized and brought back home. When Kim returned back home, Elizabeth was furious. And that was really the last straw for her. And so she forbade Kim from seeing Lucas ever again. Like, not only is he not allowed in the house, you are not allowed to see this boy anywhere. You're done. So naturally, Kim and Lucas were sneaking around, only seeing each other at school and lying and seeing each other at night. This arrangement was a struggle for Kim. And in early 2016, she confided in a teacher and wrote her a letter that said, quote, I've tried to remain strong, but I can't fight anymore. Now I feel that death is the only way, end quote. The teacher, alarmed, referred Kim to a youth mental health service. And Kim was evaluated and then she was just let go. I guess they didn't feel that the threat was credible and no evidence of mental illness was found. But then in March 2016, Lucas got expelled from school and he had to go to a different school further away. So now Kim and Lucas are trying desperately to sneak around and see each other and they can't see each other at school anymore. So now they're only seeing each other on some nights and they just couldn't handle it. And Kim became very depressed. She was really struggling with the separation. And Kim ended up attempting suicide by overdosing on painkillers. She was rushed to the ER and she did recover and she was hospitalized. She told her psychiatrist that she attempted suicide because her life had become, quote, like a living, walking hell, end quote, because she wasn't allowed to see Lucas and because she hated her mother. After this, Elizabeth had their doctor refer them to family counseling, which they did begin doing. But despite the counseling, nothing could convince Kim to stay away from Lucas. On April 3rd, 2016, I just found this interaction kind of interesting. Kim posted on Facebook a moody black and white selfie. And Elizabeth commented on the photo and asked, where's your beautiful smile? And Kim replied, it disappeared. Elizabeth asked, why, hun? And Kim replied, I don't know, followed by a bunch of emojis. Panda, bear, unicorn, cookie, glasses, smiley face, smiley face, upside down smiley face. And then Elizabeth joked, I think it's under your bed. And then both of them replied with silly gifts. And this was 10 days before Elizabeth and Katie were murdered. On April 9th, Kim and Elizabeth got into a big argument. 
probably over Lucas. And Kim says that Elizabeth said to her, you're going to turn out just like your father, which really pissed Kim off. So she stormed out and ran off to Lucas's house. And the two of them barricaded themselves in Lucas's bedroom. The court documents explain this situation like this. Kim and Lucas barricaded themselves in Lucas's bedroom. And I guess at some point during the night, Kim realized she left her birth control at her house. So they snuck out, went back to Kim's house, snuck in, got her birth control, and then went back to Lucas's house. But when they snuck back over to Lucas's, Lucas's family, quote, rugby tackled him and restrained him. And Kim was kicked out back to her own house. Then when Kim arrived home, her mother had put all of her shit from her bedroom into garbage bags. And Lucas's room back at his aunt's house had also been completely cleared out. I don't know if the two families like conspired to do this, but I kind of feel like they had to have. Like, what are the odds that they both would have like cleared out their shit out of their bedrooms on the same night, you know? But I don't know. I couldn't find anywhere if they had conspired together. But obviously, Kim and Lucas put most of the blame on Elizabeth for trying to break them up. And they considered Elizabeth to be the biggest obstacle standing in the way of their love. And their anger towards her just bubbled over. So the two of them were sitting at a McDonald's. And I guess Lucas said to Kim, I wish I could kill them. And I guess Kim was like, ha, ha, yeah, totally. And then she realized Lucas wasn't joking. And so then she got serious, too. And she was like, yeah, totally. Next thing you know, they're planning a murder. They discussed their plans for a couple of days. The plan was Lucas was going to steal four kitchen knives from his aunt's kitchen, put them in a bag, and walk to Kim's house, which was about a 30-minute walk. Then he would knock on her window three times. She would let him into the house, and they would do the thing. Lucas planned to kill Elizabeth, and Kim was supposed to kill Katie. And they planned to kill Katie basically because they knew she would call the cops. She would tell on them. They tried to execute this plan two times, but Kim kept falling asleep. So Lucas would get there and knock on the window and she wouldn't answer because she was asleep. How can you fucking fall asleep when you know your boyfriend's coming over to kill your mom? That is some next level crazy. Something is off in their brains. But then on the night of April 13th, 2016, Kim managed to stay awake. And here comes Lucas, knock, knock, knock on her bedroom window. She waves and points to the bathroom window. She goes and opens the window. He passes his bag through to Kim, and then he climbs through himself. Okay, heads up. I'm going to talk about the actual murder now, okay? Lucas pulled out an eight-inch kitchen knife that he had taken from his aunt's kitchen. He held onto that one. He gave a second knife to Kim, which he said she held but never used. Then Lucas just waltzed right into Elizabeth's bedroom where she was sound asleep, lying in bed on her side, and he just stabbed her right in the throat. And this is so messed up. They planned that out in advance. And they just very casually told the police later, like, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's where the voice box is. So we figured just, like, cut that so they can't scream. You know, it's so fucked up. The pathologist later said that Elizabeth had a total of eight stab wounds five of which were to her hands because she was defending herself, and the rest were to her throat and shoulders and chest area. And then Lucas got on top of her and started smothering her with a pillow. Kim was just outside the bedroom door listening. And Kim said that she heard really weird noises, like gurgling, and that she actually got really worried about Lucas. So she just popped into the bedroom to check on Lucas to make sure he was all right. Fucking ew. And it gets even worse. Kim said that she couldn't see her mother very well because Lucas was on top of her, right? And then a hand reached out and Kim just instinctively grabbed it and held it because she thought it was Lucas's hand. And she said that when she realized it was her mother's hand, she just dropped it. That broke my heart. That is, she is one sick fucker. Kim later said it took about 10 minutes for Elizabeth to die, but Lucas said, no, it was no more than three minutes. Lucas then checked Elizabeth's pulse and confirmed that she was dead. Then I guess Kim had a bit of a panic attack, and she said she decided that she could not go through with killing Katie. And so Lucas was like, no problem, I got this. So Lucas then walked into Kim and Katie's bedroom where Katie was asleep. He stabbed her, but he said he couldn't be sure if he stabbed her or the mattress. Then he started smothering her with a pillow and then continued to stab Katie. 
He slashed at her voice box as well. And then when she stopped moving, he checked her pulse and confirmed she was dead as well. Kim asked Lucas if Katie was dead, and he said yes. She asked if she struggled, and he said no. Later, the cops asked Lucas, so the only reason that you killed Katie was because you were worried she would call the cops? And Lucas said, pretty much. So they went through with their plan. Now what? You would think they would run for it and go start their romantic life together or whatever. But no, they just fucking hung out. Kim told Lucas to take off his clothes because he had blood on his clothes and on his face. And Lucas said later that he was bummed out that he got blood on that shirt because he liked that shirt and he wanted to wear it again. Come on, man. Kim drew them a bath and then they bathed together and Kim washed the blood off of Lucas. What the fuck? Just having a romantic bath after murdering her family. Once they were all cleaned up, Kim's like, well, we can't sleep in here on my bed next to my dead sister. So they got her mattress hauled it out of her bedroom, down the stairs, and put it in the living room. Then they had sex. And then they raided the liquor cabinet, made some cocktails, got some ice cream, and had a Twilight movie marathon. Are you kidding me? Well, we've just killed my family. What should we do now? Twilight movie marathon. They must have really related to Bella and Edward's obsessive, unhealthy relationship, huh? Where no one mattered but them. And how Bella and Edward were both suicidal when they couldn't be together in the second one. And how they murdered all the vampires that got in their way. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm following their fucked up train of thought a little bit. But anyway, that's how they got their stupid media name of the Twilight Killers. It's, it's pretty silly. Yeah, but aren't all killers' nicknames from the media kind of silly? Originally, the two had planned to take their own lives after the murders, and they wrote a suicide that read, quote, fuck you, world. I want to be cremated, and I want mine and Lucas's ashes to be scattered at our special place. We don't give a fuck anymore, end quote. But obviously, they didn't go through with unaliving themselves, so they just stayed for those 36 hours, sleeping on that mattress in the living room, watching Twilight movies, having sex, eating ice cream, drinking cocktails. And you know another fucked up detail? I don't know why this stuck out to me so much, but there was only one bathroom. And it was upstairs, right next to their... Every time they had to pee or whatever, they had to walk upstairs and walk past Elizabeth and Katie's bodies to use the bathroom. I found that bothersome. I mean, this is all very bothersome. I don't know. I don't know. We have talked about folly adieu, shared madness, several times already on Cleaning in Crime. And here's another one. Like, the two of them together were a very dangerous mix. Apart, they were, you know, troubled teens. But together, they were deadly. So, we know the cops came after 36 hours, got into the house, found the kids, and brought them to the police station, right? They were separated and they both gave their accounts of what happened very calmly, completely emotionless, showed no remorse. And that never changed. Like from the time they were arrested, through the confessions, through the trials, and to now. Like just nothing. No emotions, no remorse, nothing. When Kim was being interrogated by the detectives, she said, quote, He constantly asked me if I wanted to go through with it. And I said yes. And I asked him, and he said yes. We decided on Sunday, but I had felt like murdering for quite a while, end quote. And she also flat out said she did not regret anything. And when she was asked if she was glad that her mother was dead, she replied, quote, yes, because my mom doesn't have to deal with me anymore, like being suicidal. And she doesn't have to wake up worrying every morning to see if I'm still alive. And my sister doesn't have to go through all the heartbreak and emotions and stuff, end quote. Like, It's so bizarre. The fact that she thinks Elizabeth and Katie are better off. Like she did them a favor by having Lucas kill them. Because now her mother won't have to deal with her? And her sister won't have to deal with the heartbreak and emotion of losing her mother? What the fuck? Lucas basically told the police that he did it to protect Kim. He loved her and he had to protect her from any perceived threat. Even though Lucas did the actual stabbings, it was decided that Kim was equally responsible and both of them were charged with murder. In the UK, at the age of 10, you are held criminally responsible for your actions. So essentially, the two were charged as adults. Lucas's defense was shooting for manslaughter due to diminished capacity. But a psychological evaluation done by Dr. Oliver White, to paraphrase, 
said Lucas basically had a rough childhood. He was in the foster care system. He had childhood trauma. And he was left with difficulty regulating his own emotions. But due to his age, he couldn't definitively be diagnosed with a personality disorder. But Dr. White believed that he was on the path to receiving a personality disorder diagnosis in adulthood. But he knew right from wrong. He knew what he did. So based on that evaluation at that time, at that age, Lucas did not have an insanity defense. Couldn't do it. So Lucas ended up pleading guilty to murder and he forfeited his trial. Done. No trial. Kim pleaded not guilty to manslaughter due to diminished responsibility, trying to reduce it from murder to manslaughter. But that was rejected. She had her trial a week later and she pleaded not guilty to murder. And the girl turned on Lucas. She blamed her mental state, and that Lucas was incredibly controlling and controlled her every move. No longer was Kim obsessed with Lucas. No longer was she desperately in love with him. She was over it, like totally detached from him right away. But she acted like, oh, it's not my fault after she said a ton of bonker shit to the psychiatrists. So psychiatrists Dr. Philip Joseph for the prosecution and Dr. Chakrabarty for the defense both evaluated Kim and both spoke at the trial to try to explain what the fuck happened. Dr. Joseph for the prosecution told the court that the two's relationship was toxic. He said that if they hadn't gotten together, he didn't think any of this would have happened. And he compared them to Bonnie and Clyde. He said Kim did not suffer from a recognized mental disorder, but she did feel like she wasn't really part of her family unit. And because of the things Kim told him, he believed Kim was just unhappy in her family and was jealous of her sister and just decided she wanted to kill her mother. Here are some of the things that Kim said to this psychiatrist. I don't miss my mom, and I'm glad she's dead, even though I'm in a sticky situation now. She deserved it. I'm glad she's dead. I was getting rid of the only problem I could see. We felt laid back about what had happened. Neither of us felt bad about it. And when they asked why they killed Katie, she said, I thought it would be better for my sister to die too. I did not kill my sister out of anger. I miss her, but I was excited about killing my mother and I was looking forward to it. And she also said, I was okay with it. The fact that it happened so quickly gave me peace of mind because it wasn't like torture or anything. Also on the stand, Dr. Joseph said that Kim told him this was jointly planned, that she agreed to go forward with the plan. Nobody forced her. And he also pointed out that Kim remained happy with what she did. And she had no remorse, even as the trial approached many months later. Dr. Chakrabarty for the defense, which that name makes me think of iZombie. Did you watch that show? Mm. He's one of my celebrity crushes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Dr. Chakrabarty said Kim has an attachment disorder and she has attachment issues. Uh, That's it. That's all I got. It also seemed that Kim really enjoyed all the attention she was getting from all of these doctors. And she even suggested that she'd like to write a book about her life. And the doctor that she said that to said that that showed she had an inappropriate level of self-esteem and self-importance. Kim's older half-sister, Mary, the one who was married, had kids, and lived in a different town, she says she went to Kim's trial and she was completely shocked at Kim's lack of remorse. And she said when Kim looked up at her in the courtroom, she smirked. Mary said it looked like a smirk that was saying, ha ha. And Mary said she had to leave the courtroom because she felt physically ill. Fuck. The jury deliberated for two hours and they came back with a unanimous guilty verdict for murder. At sentencing, the judge ripped the two of them a new one and sentenced them both to life with a minimum 20-year sentence. But they did appeal and that ended up being reduced. They still got life, but the minimum was reduced to 17 and a half years. Yikes. Hopefully they both stay in for life, but there is a possibility that if they're rehabilitated, they could be released after 17 and a half years. We'll have to see. Rest in peace to Elizabeth and Katie Edwards. And that story sucked. God. And that is the end of today's true crime story about the Twilight Killers. Yes, the name is Silly. If you liked today's story, give me a like, leave me a comment, let me know what you thought of the story, and also leave me a comment if you have a case you'd like to request. Thank you so much for watching today's video, and I am so sorry, but I'm taking next week off. I know I'm so sorry, but I swear it's for a good reason. My family and I just closed on a little seasonal summer cabin. 
So I'm headed up there to clean and set up and decorate and do all the really fun stuff and then spend the holiday weekend enjoying it. As you watch it in your world, it is already the holiday and I've already been there, closed on the cabin and set it up and have enjoyed it. But in my world, filming it in advance, I haven't even closed and gotten the keys yet. So I'm going to edit this. I'm going to go close on this cabin and then go enjoy it. And then I'll be back in two weeks. And I'll probably get some really good footage of me cleaning the cabin for my videos. So that's a plus. I will definitely show the cabin on YouTube when I get it all set up. So yeah, I'm really sorry to make you guys wait two weeks, but this is my 26th episode and they are all on a playlist easily accessible on YouTube. So maybe you've missed some and this is a great time for you to catch up. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.